Thank you. <clears throat> what we decided to do was, um, rather than giving two more presentations with PowerPoint, that what we would do is um, we would each talk for about 10 minutes and um, astonishingly listen to each other. There's quite a lot of substantial overlap. And then we're going to open it up for questions and discussion moderated by Andreas, as far as I know. So I'm going to begin. Um, I guess my takeaway from at least my version of the session is question about why there's been so little take up of ecological economic. Uh, Michael Waronin in, in the session before us um, is that there really isn't a very powerful model of the person or the self in ecological economics, although we have in ecological economics a lot of very warm and um, Standard economics has an extremely powerful model of the person and the self and has a, a lot of power behind it, not just because of um, the abstract nature of standard economics, but because it fulfills or appears to fulfill a lot of very powerful needs in our society, including dreams about freedom, infinite capacity. I wanted to spend my 10 minutes talking a little bit about that trajectory. And it's a bit overshadowed <clears throat> today because of what happened in Oregon yesterday. Um, I was talking to somebody on the bus this morning who comes from Oregon, and I wanted to say on behalf of the Canadians here how sorry we are about what happened yesterday. I decided with some colleagues to try and look at what was going wrong with people in the environmental movement who I knew who had burned out, who were in despair, who um, felt that it didn't matter what we did with the environment, that it was all going to go wrong. And, um, and you may have people, friends, colleagues, who felt that it didn't really matter what we did, that it, the momentum was so strong, or even if we were able to accomplish certain numbers of things, that we were eventually going to leave an impoverished world, that it was going to be too much for us. And they were in various forms of despair, really suffering from despair, but they had this feeling about what was going to happen for their children and their grandchildren. So I and a couple of colleagues, um, went back to look at the work of people like Robert J. Lifton and Joanna Macy, who had been working on despair and empowerment in nuclear power. And they had had a series of workshops in this area, and Joanna Macy herself. So I hosted a couple of workshops in this area. And uh, they were very, very powerful people who had been uh, suffering from this situation. Either they were burned out, or they just felt that the situation that we were faced with was quite hopeless. And in the course of that, I um, came to the workshops and they immediately started talking about personal tragedies that they had been involved with, mournings that they had been going through. And I went back to look at the original work on mourning that was done by Freud back in 1915, 1916. And <clears throat> originally Freud, if you don't know this, originally Freud had a theory of mourning. And his theory of mourning was that um, eventually when you've had a, a great loss, I'm sure everybody in this room has had some experience of great loss at some time. And it didn't work anymore. And in the early 1920s, he decided that everything he thought about mourning was complete. He was in melancholia. The idea of mourning that will not go away, and you all know about Hamlet and other examples of melancholia, maybe Albrecht Durer's angel. And this idea was that um, there are people who have gone through lots of mourning and they cannot come out the other side. And is this a bad thing, they cannot come out the, out the outside the other side? And he developed an idea of the melancholic self, the idea that we are all in, in a I have a colleague, Kate Sandlins, who works on queer ecology, and part of her work is looking on mourning and melancholia in the queer community because of what happened in the AIDS situation in the 1990s and 80s and so on. <clears throat> anyway, out of this analysis of mourning and melancholia, back again, when you've whether you've lost a person or whether you've said things that you should never have said and you can never take them back again. And this turned into a discussion about the question about the romantic self, the romantic individual, and the question about infinite desire and the capacity of people to try and get a set of things or this question about the infinite desires and the things that people will want. They will always want more. They will always want something new. And from that, I went to look at, this is a few years later, went to look at the notion of where the modern notion of the self had come from. And some of you may know the work of Charles Taylor, 
wrote a book called Sources of the Self, but lots of other that hybridized abstract physics, the kind of things that were talked about this morning, this kind of 19th century physics, because abstract physics was so powerful, and the notion of the romantic individual. So that we now live in a weird circumstance, a circumstance of a society that is full of a mass of that I believe is much more important than whether there are 10 billion people on the planet. What's really difficult to deal with is having 10 billion people with a mental model of the world of infinite desire where the, the model of the human is this one of breaking all boundaries and all chains. Essential to romantic individualism is this idea that whenever somebody presents a wrestling with that model of the infinitely free self, smashing all boundaries and moving on, we will never be able to get these beautiful ecological economics models that we subscribe to um, uh, in, 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 into common play. It's, that model is just so powerful. And the question about boundaries, about the finite, about drawing a boundary around the self, what does that do? When you've finally taken the romantic individual, the, the modern person with these, these whole things we've been talking about, some of us this morning, about this infinite capacity to consume and desire that's being promulgated, what happens when you say no? When you say you show them the Rockstrom diagram, or you say we have to draw a boundary around it? And since there's a Ken Boulding winner sitting here, and there's another one sitting over there, Ken Boulding once said, when you draw a boundary around something, everything within it now becomes more sensitive and interconnected. And that's the situation that I think we find ourselves in. We find ourselves on a planet where boundaries have been drawn, partly from the, the Earth from space, but the boundaries are, if you like, constraining this mass of people who are st still living in a different kind of model. So what happens then? What I believe is what's happening among some people, and it will, will become more and more important, is what I call an implosion of sensibility. It's like if you take a nuclear weapon, uh, to get a nuclear weapon going, you need to have smaller bombs that kind of smash the atomic bomb uh, into existence. And I think we're in the middle of an implosion of sensibility. And this implosion it shows itself up in ecology, it shows itself up in the interest in indigenous peoples, it shows itself up in interests in other kinds of traditions and so on, as we try and develop a new model of the self, a new model of the person that is actually bounded and finite to match the planet. And people who don't like this, not only people who are part of the standard economic model, but people who want to flee from the Earth, people who want to go to Mars or out beyond before we figured out what it is to be Earthlings, before we figured out what it is to actually live on this planet as human beings. So what I've been working on over the last while is looking at alternative traditions, traditions where people have had to be finite in order to actually survive. They weren't sort of saying, hi, we're living in a finite tradition. They were living in bounded situations. Uh, uh, Jeff Garver this morning talked about the Sin and Nussbaum work uh, on, on bounded capabilities. I think these are, these are peoples, and everybody in this room knows that. These are peoples who have lived for many years, sometimes sustainable for thousands of years, in quite different ethics, quite different ways of thinking about the world, and that's what I work on now. I work particularly on the Buddhist communities, partly because I've been a Buddhist for about 25 years myself, and I'm interested in that from a personal point of view. But this question about whether or not we should be involving religion, theology, and ethics in ecological economics seems to me to be central. I think we have to find a way of thinking about how to learn to live in a finite world. And what does it mean to the notions of the self and to the person when we have to live that way? And I think it's a fundamental existential struggle. And it's a struggle that I struggle with every day because I'm saturated in modern romantic individualism. And I think it's something that we all struggle with as much as we can. And we're trying to find different ethical paths. And I think ethical, ecological economics needs that. And it's one of the reasons why I'm really looking forward to sharing this podium with Bill because he overlaps with, again, this search for a new way of thinking about the person in ecological economics. Thank you.